This is Epicenter, episode 380 with guest Tishan Roger. Hi, I'm Sebastian Couture, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level, and we fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like Epicenter, the best way to support us is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're on a Mac or iOS device, the easiest way to do that is to go to epicenter.rocks slash Apple. And if you're new to the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Today, our guest is Tishan Roger. He's the CEO of Namebase. Namebase is a top-level domain name registrar that operates on the Handshake blockchain. It allows people to register top-level domains like .epicenter, for example. Traditionally, this is a role which has been held by ICANN. It's an international organization which governs the world's TLDs. Well, Namebase wants to bring more decentralization to this existing system. Instead of creating an entirely new namespace, which is the case for ENS and unstoppable domains, they have an augmentative approach. So a name base, one can register TLDs that aren't already captured by the ICANN system. So you couldn't take over .com or .io, but you could register .kittens. And buying TLDs happens in an on-chain auction instead of a long and expensive application process that only benefits ICANN. Another interesting benefit of using name base is that it makes certificate authorities obsolete since the Handshake blockchain acts as a signing authority for every request. So it's actually more secure than what we already have. When you buy a TLD on Namebase, you own that TLD and you can build a business around it. So for example, if you're into electronic music, you could acquire the .dj TLD and build a registrar company that targets musicians. Essentially, Namebase wants to decentralize ICANN by making available the platform that enables decentralized governance of TLDs. Politically, I think this is really hard to achieve since the size of the domain name market is probably in the hundreds of billions of dollars per year and there are huge geopolitical implications around TLDs, specifically country TLDs. But I think it's a really noble goal, given the enormous amount of power that's held by ICANN. And of course, there's just so much untapped value in this market, since there are literally an infinite number of TLDs that are currently not offered in the ICANN system. So with that, here's our conversation with Tishan Roger. We're here with Tishan Roger. He is the CEO of... Namebase and Namebase is building a decentralized name system for the internet. We use name systems pretty much every day when you type a domain name into your browser. You're uh, using the DNS system, and you know that translates that uh, that domain name into an IP address. And domain names are organized and uh, controlled by this organization called ICANN, which we'll get into during the interview. But um, Namebase is trying to build a decentralized version of that. Uh, so thanks for joining us today. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Great. Uh, so yeah, tell us a little bit about your background and like what you were doing before crypto and why you felt this was a problem that you wanted to spend your time working on solving. Yeah, I was always super interested in startups uh, when I was younger in high school. Uh, so actually, when I was 16, I did uh, I did end up leaving high school, flew over to Silicon Valley, and I started working at a company called Teespring. They were this tech startup, and I worked there as an engineer for about a year, actually, when I was 16. And then from there, instead of returning back to high school, I ended up starting a company. Uh, it was a recruiting startup. Um, ended up actually shutting it down eventually, but I started this company called Strong Intro, and we actually ended up going through Y Combinator, which is the startup accelerator that's fairly well known if you're you know into startups, but they funded Reddit, Airbnb, Dropbox, uh, Stripe, DoorDash, you know, a bunch of different tech companies. So uh, I was super lucky and was able to go through that program for my company. Uh, and then about a year into that, realized that I wanted to go to school, uh, be close to the family. So I ended up actually uh, applying to MIT, got in uh, and studied math and computer science at MIT for about two years before I met my co-founder, Anthony. And, uh, you know, Anthony was also a CS major, really, really, really brilliant. And we just started working together on different side projects, uh, exploring crypto at a certain point. We kind of caught that bug back in 2018. And then, you know, in that kind of like random search, we found Handshake uh, as a protocol. And that's the protocol that Namebase builds on top of. That's the decentralized CNS protocol 
that we're building on top of. And given that Anthony and I are both engineers, we kind of just fell in love with it just because of the technical improvements that Handshake makes to the existing DNS system. You know, without getting too much into it, it's fairly duct taped together in terms of how DNS works today. And Handshake just improved along, you know, security and ownership and censorship resistance. Uh, And as engineers, we both really like that. And then also just given my experience um, in startups before, I also really liked a lot of the mechanics that uh, were built into the protocol to enable adoption. And we kind of saw this potential for Handshake to become this naming system that uh, the internet could rely on in a really robust way. Uh, And we wanted to help enable adoption for it, which is why we ended up starting Namebase. So was Namebase the like first foray that you had into crypto or were you, what were some of the side projects you were working on other than Namebase? Yeah, we were, oh man, this was so long ago that I'm probably going to be butchering any of the specific ideas. I think at one point we were looking at different wallets. Uh, I feel like in 2018, everyone was like, oh yeah, like the wallets are going to be like the browser for crypto and all that. So we're looking at, you know, different wallets. We're looking at like blockchain and healthcare ideas yeah actually like shadowed a bunch of doctors talked to them uh had this one founder who is like whatever you do he called me up and he was like whatever you do do not go into healthcare so many startup founders even really successful ones they're like okay like you know did this now i want to go and solve healthcare and they just got get burned out a few years later um so that was really funny but for handshake we ended up getting really really excited we were most excited about that just because the uh, the benefits of it were so concrete. And we also kind of saw this trend on the internet of basically the central, the existing Web 2.0 internet getting more consolidated and uh, centralized and censored over time. And this was back in 2018 when basically no one except for like cyberpunks and, you know, maybe like journalists and a few uh, techies cared about the issue. And then now it's something that, you know, everyone's talking about. So, you know, that thesis actually kind of started to prove itself out in the last few months, which has been really interesting. But uh, those those are some of the older ideas. So it's not the first time people have tried to do this sort of solve this naming problem in the blockchain space. It, like, you know, the earliest one is probably, is probably like Namecoin. And that's like, that's like basically... You know, you you could even call that like the first altcoin. And it's like, you know, Satoshi talked about Namecoin. What was wrong with some of these earlier approaches? And why is now the time for this to be happening? Yeah, that's a great question. And you're totally right. There have been uh, a ton of predecessors in the naming space that Handshake's been able to take inspiration from. And actually, you know, if you go on uh, to Bitcoin Talk, you can see Satoshi uh, even specked out, I think it was like the second use case after like cr- cryptocurrency was he was like, oh, like BitDNS, like we should have DNS on the blockchain. So this is something that has been kind of like a, dr- a dream for a while. And, uh, you know, the analogy is, you know, before, before Bitcoin, there were numerous attempts at digital currencies, right? Like the gold and all these other ones that basically didn't have the right ingredients and uh, to succeed. And, and I would say the ingredients are both the technology and the mechanics themselves and also the cultural moment for people to actually care about the technology. So I'll, t- I'll first talk about the technology first. Uh, so just looking at Namecoin as, in, as an example, for any naming system, the distribution of names is uh, really, really important to get right. And it's, it's even more important than the distribution of a, a fungible token like Bitcoin, for example, because a fungible token is it's easily, you know, it's, it's transferable, whereas names are non-fungible. And what can happen if you get a distribution that's not, you know, spread out is you have, you know, early adopters that can go and claim up a ton of the namespace, of the available namespace, and they may basically make it uh, impossible for the network effect to kick in, for people to adopt it, because there's no incentive for new members to come in and claim their own, you know, piece of digital land and go in, uh, enable further adoption. So the challenge with Namecoin is that the distribution mechanics were not ideal. The names were one available on a first come first serve basis, and they were also uh, priced at a flat fee that uh, basically just kind of like went down over time. And so what? what you, and it was a very cheap flat fee. And so what you got was you have these early adopters that were able to just buy up all the good names and. 
what that creates is this dynamic where it's, uh, you know, newer adopters, right? You're six months in, they're not going to go and adopt the namespace because all of the early adopters have already gone the names at such a cheap price that they're not going to sell and they're just hodling, you know, they want to get a payday. Um, and that basically cripples the ecosystem. And so the, the thing that Handshake did that when, it, when we first, uh, you know, discovered it and we're reading the white paper, we really liked that Handshake created mechanics that would mitigate this. They did two things here. Uh, actually, they did more than two things, but the two main things were, one, they rolled out the names over the course of the first year so that on day one, you could only register a small portion of the names. And then each week, a new portion of the namespace became available for registration. And that just enabled the early adopters, that prevented the early adopters from being able to uh, buy up all of the namespace without any competition. And then on top of that, instead of selling names for a flat fee, they created this auction system that basically uh, enables uh, you know, a true market price to be discovered for the name. So for example, if you were bidding on you know, Sunny and you bid 1,000 HNS and I bid 500 HNS, you would actually win Sunny and you would pay 500 HNS, you know, the second highest bid price to own the name. And it, actually, interestingly enough, you would pay it not to some sort of like Handshake Foundation or to Namebase or anything like that. It's actually burned on chain, creating a deflationary effect. But effectively, those two mechanics, the, uh, the slow rollout and the auction me mechanism made it so that there's a much greater distribution of names on Handshake uh, than some of the predecessors like Namecoin. So I'm curious if you, because you, you were talking about like how this compares to other name systems. I suppose you were talking about like the existing uh, domain name system and, and ICANN and the way that that was rolled out. Do you think that that this particularly was an issue with ICANN? I mean, of course, with like TLDs like .com, et cetera, there's like a lot of those domain names, the very good ones were bought up early on. But what has happened in the last couple of years is we've seen like, an explosion in other TLDs that has effectively like opened up the, the namespace now into exponentially more domain names. Do you feel that this remains an issue with the existing ICANN system? And yeah, like what, what are your thoughts on like how that has actually played out? In mm, Yeah, great question. Uh, so you're talking about um, the distribution problem, right? Yeah, sorry, that's right. Yeah, the distribution problem. And to be clear, the, the distribution of uh, namespace, that's only relevant to, uh, that's only a rel relevant problem to um, new uh, like startup naming systems like Namecoin or ENS or Handshake. The ICANN DNS system as it is actually has a fairly good distribution. And that is uh, more so due to uh, path dependency so for, you know, when, when the DNS first came out, it was very non-commercialized and it, it was that way for uh, a long time. And it, and it was actually, uh, it wasn't a few years into the existence of it that you actually had to start paying for a domain name. So actually when, when DNS first came out, you could register .coms of, anyone get .coms for free because basically just like hobbyists and researchers. So it was actually very non-commercial in nature. And so there wasn't really this uh, land rush issue uh, that exists today because now people know that domain names are incredibly valuable. You know, in the secondary marketplace, there's about a billion dollars worth of domain names turning over uh, every year. And that's just trading hands in the secondary marketplace. And then the value of domain names uh, on, on their own, on top of just like the turnover, uh, is really in the, the tens of billions. And so now that people know how valuable the namespace is, you kind of have this uh, additional challenge of, okay, how do you have the distribution be fair uh, versus the organic adoption that um, the ICANN system kind of had in its early days, due, just due to, you know, it's how early it was. Okay, I didn't realize you were talking specifically about the sort of like blockchain namespaces, but yeah, that's interesting. Perhaps it would be interesting to talk a little bit about ICANN as an organization. I think most of our listeners know that ICANN exists, they know the role that it serves, but l let me describe what that organization looked like. looks like and what role they actually play in managing like the global domain name system? So uh, ICANN is a super interesting organization uh, because it actually started out as uh, really this like super awesome organization is all these 
uh, just like internet OGs uh, that really, you know, all the people who are very early pioneers of the internet, they're all kind of these like cyberpunks. They're all really into decentralization. You know, they had all these manifestos and it's very philosophically driven. Uh, ICANN over time has uh, effectively suffered from the same problem that suffers, you know, any centralized organization that uh, presides over a very, very valuable resource, which is, is kind of fall into, you know, cor corruption and cronyism. And basically the role that ICANN plays is they determine who gets what TLD. So each TLD is actually owned by a different uh, company or jurisdiction or, or country even. And uh, so, for example, .com is owned by VeriSign, which is a for-profit uh, company. And they basically make money off of every, every .com that you buy. You, you're actually just renting from VeriSign. You know, .io is uh, owned by the Indian Ocean. And so ICANN is an organization that controls who gets what TLD. The uh, challenge is that over time it's become worse and worse. If you go and look up the ICANN glass door, you can kind of read about uh, how, how bad the management is. And then also, most recently, there's a huge fiasco with uh, .org, which is meant to be, uh, you know, like for nonprofits and different organizations. Uh, that was actually managed by a nonprofit internet organization. And then uh, basically in this like backdoor deal, the former ICANN CEO almost successfully purchased .org through a private equity fund. Uh, and it was something that was like, it wasn't like an open auction or anything like that. It was just like really sneakily done. Uh, and then there's a basically a huge uprising and the uh, California attorney general had to step in and say, hey, ICANN, you can't do this. Uh, and then they were able to actually prevent the sale of .org to this private equity fund that was controlled by the uh, former ICANN CEO. So that just kind of illustrates, you know, that kind of some of the problems that you'll see with governance here, which, you know, really is, is something that's inherent to any centralized system over time. Uh, that's like the, you know, democracy versus single point of failure debate that always happens in governments. But that's, that's something, that's the dynamic that plays out with ICANN. One of the concerns I always had a little bit with handshake was this notion that I hear you on all these things that like, you know, I can, it has some like governance issues and stuff, but like the way I see it is it's on the internet. If we're moving towards the D web, there's all, there's so many like things to go do, like there's so many giants to slay, like Google, the amount of control that entities like Google have over like all of the internet infrastructure and stuff is just like out of all these giants to go slay is I can really the one that like we should be spent dedicating this much of our effort towards at the end of the day, they are a nonprofit and do seem to have the best interests of the internet at heart, at least relatively to maybe some of the other entities that serve as risks to the, you know, open internet. And so like for me, what I see handshake is as really as like a technical problem that solves like a security issue with DNS, where it's like, okay, DNS has all these security issues that I think we can get into uh, in a bit, but why not go to ICANN and be like, hey, you you are well aware of all these D security issues with the internet, like DNS system. Why not convince them like, hey, a blockchain solution is what will solve all their problems? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And on, on that strategy specifically, Handshake is very much in the boat of, so for example, ENS, you know, we, we know the ENS team fairly well. We talk with them, we like them. And their philosophy is very much, okay, let's work within the existing ICANN system and uh, try to, you know, use uh, blockchain domain names uh, and get them adopted by ICANN. And uh, Handshake's philosophy is very much like, that's like Uber going to the taxi cabs and trying to convince the taxi cab industry to adopt Uber. So ICANN really has no incentive to go and adopt a blockchain-based DNS system. Uh, effectively, in order for them to do that, they would have to be willing to give up their power and, and source of making money. ICANN has made hundreds of millions of dollars from the TLD application fee, actually, uh, in addition to the, you know, the, the individuals that you know, maybe are, have been able to profit, like the former ICANN CEO. And so they actually have no incentive to go and adopt this and to give up control. And then you also touch on a really good point, which is the difference between decentralizing uh, governance and decentralizing the uh, underlying 
uh, technical system itself. And they're, they're fairly related because if you don't have decentralized governance, then you, you still have a, a centralized system in many regards. Uh, right. If you have a single organization that can take down domains, then it's still uh, centralized. You know, putting it onto a blockchain doesn't really do much. So you kind of need both. And we talked about the decentralizing governance. But the thing that uh, for me is what is most exciting about Handshake is decentralizing DNS at um, the uh, te technology level. And this is something and this is why, like, you know, for for example, when we first discovered Handshake, we weren't even aware of. Uh, all the issues with ICANN because you're right they're kind of behind the scenes most people don't think about them uh, and that was so that wasn't even the thing that got us excited the thing that's really exciting about Handshake is that it actually can enable a new paradigm of applications that previously were not possible because of uh, how DNS is constructed uh, effectively the main problem that Handshake solves is it's uh, actually a security problem uh, it's solving the certificate authority issue that exists in the uh, DNS today, which is getting a little technical here, but you know you can think of DNS as this tree uh, of trust. At the top, you have ICANN, and then you have the TLD owners like Verisign, etc. cetera. Uh, and then you have the in individual domain uh, you know, renters, right? Every time you get a domain name, you're going through the registrar, and then you're able to uh, you know, rent it from the registrar you know, for, for a year at a time or more. And it's actually fairly decentralized, except the higher up you go in the tree, it's not decentralized. It becomes more centralized as you, know, as you go to the top. And there's an issue with security because the root of trust is basically a set of private keys that's locked in a safe that needs to be updated every three months. And actually the security practices for that are, um, there, there are a lot of issues with it. And, and because of that, you also need to rely on these third parties called certificate authorities, which is like your computer trusts thousands of certificate authorities uh, every time you're visiting a website. And uh, the security model is that every one of those certificate authorities has to be uh, trustworthy in order for your internet connection to be secure. And if even a single one, and, and their their CAs are gonna be based in like Hong Kong and all these other jurisdictions. So it's not just CAs like based in the US, but basically if a single one is compromised, then your traffic is compromised. And uh, effectively what Handshake does that's so interesting is it shifts the root of trust from this certificate authority based model to a blockchain based model. Uh, and it makes the security uh, much more robust for the DNS. And then on top of that, it also makes the domain names uh, one uh, truly ownable. So now you actually have a private key that controls your domain name that gives you the right to own it versus just being able to rent the name. Uh, and also the domain names are uh, tamper resistant and censorship resistant. So there's all those technical improvements that, and I haven't talked about like what that enables, but it's, it's those fundamental te technical improvements that are really exciting about Handshake. Um, and so we were just talking about the governance just because that's kind of the, the first piece that you usually want to talk about. Uh, but it's really the technology itself that is the most exciting. You know, you mentioned this whole like certificate authority stuff. So does Handshake have a solution for that? Like, you know, this whole like certificate authority and SSL stuff is kind of separate from DNS. So is it and is it a backwards compatible replacement with SSL? If so, or is it like a have to be a replace like a complete replacement? So like, I w I wouldn't be using HTTPS anymore. I'd be having to create something new. Mm, yeah, that's a great question. And um, yeah, it is it is backwards compatible. Uh, it is still HTTPS, and it's also really important to clarify that it te technically it's like oh SSL and DNS are separate protocols, but in effect, they are uh, completely reliant on each other. Uh, you need DNS to have a secure root of trust in order for your SSL to work. And so they're actually uh, intertwined. And basically what Handshake does, and just to you know give the listeners a bit more context uh, on, on how this works, to kind of clarify it, when you go and visit a website in your browser, let's say you visit namebase.io, your computer has never visited Namebase.io before. You don't know who Namebase.io is. Uh, it could be, you know, it could be us. It could be someone else running it. Your computer doesn't know. It's just like on the internet. And your computer is trying to establish a secure connection to Namebase.io. The issue is that uh, normally if you have a HTTP connection, so if you have an unsecured connection, you have no way of knowing 
uh, whether name-based.io, the name-based.io that you think you're connecting to is actually name-based.io because every time you go and try to go uh, visit a website, your internet is basically making, uh, your network request is making numerous hops uh, you know, across the world even, maybe across different countries. Uh, and then it's coming back and saying, oh yeah, like I found name-based.io, now I'm visiting the website. So you have this issue where you can't actually trust that you're visiting the website that you think you're visiting. And what certificate authorities, what HTTPS does is it basically relies on a trusted third party, uh, in this case a CA, to sign basically a, a public key that Namebase.io presents and says, hey, Namebase.io is using this public key and they're using this to encrypt their communications with me. And I can check that this public key is uh, correct against the certificate authority list that my computer already trusts. So your computer ships with the you know, list of trusted third parties that's basically able to verify, oh, when I'm going to namebase.io, this is the correct namebase.io. Uh, and so you shift the trust from, you know, just like trusting anyone on the internet to trusting a set of, uh, you know, third parties that are pre-installed on your computer. And this is the security model of today. And what Handshake does is instead of having to have a set of trusted third parties pre-shipped with their computer, you actually just rely on the blockchain for those certificates that Namebase.io is using. So the specific model is Namebase.io generates a uh, public key. I'm calling it a public key. It's actually called a TLSA cert. So, you know, there's, there's some technical jargon here, but in effect, it's basically a public key that Namebase.io is using to encrypt communications. And Namebase.io now pins that public key to its name on uh, the blockchain. And this is data that anyone can go and verify, right? You can connect to the blockchain, you can uh, verify that the records are correct. And so now you have a high degree of confidence that that public key, even though you've never visited Namebase.io before, you can verify that that public key is correct. And that is the right public key for Namebase.io, which means that when you're communicating to a website, as long as they are uh, you know, using that public key, then you're pretty sure that that website that you're speaking to is Namebase.io. And so that's, that's the, the model that shifts, but it's actually still using the same protocols. It's still HTTPS. Uh, it's just using the Handshake blockchain as the root of trust instead of certificate authorities. So, so what it does basically is essentially is that the, the blockchain, in this case, the, the Handshake blockchain acts as the, the DNS registry where domain names uh, and all of like their DNS zones, et cetera, um, kind of live, or at least their reference there. It also has the, uh, the certificate key so that you can essentially to verify both things at the same place. So the IP address um, w where the domain name is, uh, website is hosted, and also the key that you should be checking against to make sure that your connection is um, is secure. Like that's pretty clear, and it's it's interesting. Like it makes obsolete then the certificate authority model, uh, from what I gather. Like which is a really interesting aspect of this project. Um, I wonder why why DNS itself, I and mean, maybe why DNS itself, like the DNS uh, server model, wouldn't also have this. Like you know when you're filling in your DNS zone, for example, on like I don't know. Cloudflare or whatever, if you wouldn't have like a DNS entry for your your certificate public key, and it would make, you know make obsolete the secure the certificate authority model, is that does that even make sense? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question. And so um, you're right. You're like, okay, what about pinning these names directly onto the domain name? So the the issue is basically uh, ultimately you eventually need before a blockchain the only way that you could solve trust is you eventually need some trusted third party that's saying, okay, this is valid. So even if you're not using certificate authorities as the root of trust, you're going to be using- The registrar as the root of trust. Yeah, registrar okay. yeah. or something else. And so you, you have you have the same problem. It's just, it's just where you are shifting that trusted third party. Is it the CA, is it the registrar? But that trusted third party eventually exists, right? It's the same thing with any monetary system. Before Bitcoin and blockchain, you eventually need some sort of trusted third party. And that was the core issue that Bitcoin uh, was effectively obsoleting. And that's that's the same dynamic that exists with Handshake. That's why, you know, Satoshi was like, oh, you know, domain names are like the next thing. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. In the traditional DNS system, are there, what's the reason that like these root of trust are separate for certificate authorities versus like, the DNS system? Is it just a path dependency that like, you know, this is how the system's evolved? Or is there like a, a reason it's like that? 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's basically path dependency. You know, when the internet first developed, HTTPS wasn't a thing. And you know, you'll you'll probably remember browsing even 10 years ago and a lot of websites weren't on HTTPS and even today a lot of websites aren't on HTTPS. So it's just it's just a matter of path dependency. The way the internet developed is, you know, they, they encountered all these problems and they're like, oh wow, it's actually stupid easy for people to go and, you know, it capture all your traffic and scam you and capture all your credit card information and all that, right? It's like it's like really, you know, you could go into Starbucks, you used to be able to go into Starbucks and just run uh, an extension and it would just give you everyone's Facebook passwords. Uh, and, and basically the uh, eventually people realize it's like, oh, in order to have commerce on the internet, right, in order to have transactions of value on the internet, we need to be able to do this securely. And so that's why, you know, HTTPS was inv- in, uh, invented with the best technology that it had at the time. But, you know, we've actually been fortunate enough to speak with Finn Surf, who's kind of like the father of the internet. And it was super interesting because we realized that, it was, uh, you know, if, if these designers of the initial early internet protocols uh, had access to blockchain technologies, uh, you know, to the technologies that we had today, they really would have designed it, you know, with these primitives in mind, with, you know, using blockchain, using these technologies, but they just weren't available at the time. So, you know, the best, the best way of solving trust, you know, until 10 years ago was by having a, a trusted third party at some point in the funnel. Yeah. And I mean, we, we, you mentioned something there that I think is, is important to remember that HTTPS emerged in the 90s as a means to secure uh, credit card information. And I think... I think I remember this correctly that uh, it was built at least in some cooperation with um, with like the visas and the mastercards and the banking partners and it was sort of a there would have been no buy-in from from payment service providers and credit card companies had there not been some kind of secure layer because it was way too risky um, someone might correct me on that but I think that's my uh, I think my, my internet history is right there uh, so I what one of the things that I'd like to talk about here. Maybe we just shift gears a little bit and talk about the the model, the handshake model, because it's quite unique. I mean, we've been talking a lot about ICANN here, and there's a reason for that. It's because handshake and uh, Namebase uh, are, um, you know, they they build on top of the existing domain name system, and this is very different from like other namespaces that we know, like ENS, for example, that has its own name name system. Although the use case here is perhaps different. And so many other examples of like products that try to do something similar. So there's Unstoppable Domains is one. Star Name, the IOV team is also working on a, on a uh, domain name system. You know, trying to build their own kind of like namespace and that don't overlap with ICANN. Can you explain how you've done this? Like what, what exactly does it mean to sit on top of ICANN? And uh, what does it mean for like the user who's using Namebase? You point out a very good distinction, which is Handshake is uh, different from a lot of the other blockchain domain projects and that it's actually a blockchain uh, top level domain project. So the, the names that you register on Handshake, uh, they're TLDs themselves. So for example, NB, it's not, you know, uh, if that's, that's the name on Handshake uh, that we have, that's not NB.HNS, it's actually just .NB. You own the uh, to- domain extension. Uh, every time you register a name on Handshake. Um, and that was made you know, backwards compatible by virtue of the fact that on Handshake, all of the existing ICANN TLDs are blacklisted. So for example, you know, no one can register .com, but you can register uh, non-ICANN TLDs as your own. Uh, and so you can think of Handshake as a superset of the existing ICANN TLD namespace. And the reason why it uh, targeted that is because uh, it's really this, it goes back to the, the fundamental, you know, security-oriented goals of Handshake, which is the DNS uh, as it is today in terms of the construction, it's it's fairly decentralized, except at the root. That's where the centralization exists, and that's where also the root of trust exists. And so, in order to have a secure root of trust for DNS, you need to decentralize the top-level namespace. And so that's that's why Handshake targets that, and it's it's a very of, of course very ambitious goal. And I can talk about you know I think why now is the time for something like this to succeed. But that that is a fundamental difference is that it's targeting the the domain extensions versus a, a subdomain uh, at you know a made up extension. Yeah, yeah. So let's 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 go into why now then. What why why now is not a good time to do this. And I, I think it's also really important to kind of look to history here, which is you know even for someone like Bitcoin, it 
required, right? If you, if you think about like when Bitcoin was launched, it was launched in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, right? And that was explicitly referenced, the money printing was referenced, you know, in the first Bitcoin block. Um, and I think that's really important to note because usually for something that's a groundbreaking technology, it's not just the technology itself, but also the, the cultural moment that's required for it to actually break out. Uh, and, and throughout history, there, is, there are numerous examples of uh, people inventing technologies, uh, you know, years before it broke out and then someone else invented it again, but it was the right timing uh, and that's when it broke out. And that's, I think that's a dynamic that is really important for Handshake as well. So for context, you know, as, as I mentioned before, when we started Namebase, our thesis was that the centralization, the consolidation and censorship on the Web 2.0 internet would continue to get worse over time. And that would create uh, an increasing need for uh, a decentralized internet. And decentralized DNS is a core part of that decentralized internet infrastructure. It's, it's actually the, the entry point, it's a gateway, right? Every time you go onto your web browser, uh, the first thing you type in is a domain name. So a lot of people aren't really aware of it, but they're actually using the domain name system every day. And so the, the thesis was, was that, you know, the centralization and censorship would get worse. When we started three years ago, uh, basically no one cared about that issue uh, other than, you know, like cyberpunks and, and techies and a few journalists and whatnot. And then now, three years later, we're seeing this thesis start to come to fruition where the issues of censorship have increased over time. You know, just in this last month, it was this Lollapalooza of, you know, Trump getting banned on Twitter, uh, Parler getting platformed across the entire internet stack, you know, even by hosting providers like AWS. You have uh, WhatsApp's exodus to Signal, GME trading halting, and then uh, the Wall Street Bets uh, community getting banned on Discord. So we're starting to see uh, the issues with the Web 2.0 internet really break out. And then now there's this massive wave towards decentralization. I agree with you. The censorship is is the, the, the topic du jour, but none of the censorship, or at least not that I think of, uh, involves domain names. I, I, do you, are, there, are there examples where domain names have, have been censored? I mean, other than like FBI takedowns for piracy and, and child porn, I don't really think that the ver very many domain names get censored. Yeah, so actually uh, there are a good number of domain names that get censored. Uh, if you think about the, usually the, and the people that get censored are initially these fringe users, right? Similar to how, you know, if you think about like Bitcoin, the people that initially cared about it are fringe users. But basically it's, you know, people that are building these uh, alternative social networks, right? Like Gab has had issues with their DNS uh, outside of the US. And that's, that's also very, you know, in the Western world, it's the types of domain names I guess censor are different, right? It might be like Pirate Pebe or, or Sci-Hub, for example. Sci-Hub's uh, uh, this general resource for reading uh, scientific journals that a lot of scientists use. And they basically have their domain names taken down, you know, every few months. And so they actually, it's funny because there, there's a system for existing domain name holders to claim certain names on Handshake. And Sci-Hub uh, wasn't able to use that system because the domain name that they had at the time of Genesis was, was taken away from Alexandra. And so you have resources like that having issues with their domain names. And then actually outside of the US, that's where you have a lot of uh, issues with domain names. Uh, you know, in China, you know, one in four websites actually get censored. Uh, and increasingly around the world, we're seeing more and more of that happen. So it's something that, you know, in the US today is like fairly fringe, but actually in the rest of the world is fairly prevalent. And the other aspect of this that's also important is that um, what, where does the trend point to, right? And so the, the reason why I'm, I'm pointing out this is that as there is this wave towards, towards decentralization, in order to actually have a Web 3.0 stack, you need decentralized DNS. And in order for people to actually you know, recognize that that's important is you, you need the traditional internet system to basically start failing. And it is, it is a, a bit of a hedge though. So for example, one of the, a lot of the existing domainers are now really getting into uh, handshake from the domain name industry. So this guy, Andrew Rosner, he's like the number one domainer. Uh, and, and, you know, these people are, are investors or they're, they're speculators, right? Actually, a lot of them build applications as well, but you know, they're, they're investors. And for him, he's the number one domainer in the world. And when he discovered handshake just a year ago, it was something that he considered a toy. He was like, okay, this is kind of fun. You know, people have really attempted these alternative DNS routes in the past. I'll just take a look at it. Uh, and then now a year in, I was just on a separate podcast with him. Now he sees Handshake as an important hedge 
to his portfolio because of everything that's happened, you know, on the internet in the past, you know, really month, uh, you know, past three months leading up to this month. Um, now he sees this as an important hedge where he's like, oh, wow, this world where the traditional, you know, in- internet infrastructure just completely fails over or it just becomes increasingly hostile is kind of coming into being. And so he kind of sees this as an important hedge there. And so that's, that's a trend that we're looking at, which is, you know, today it's like a pressing issue. It's important, but tomorrow it'll be a burning issue. And in, in order to actually create the, you know, decentralized Web 3.0 applications that are starting to become possible to build now. So that's another aspect that I haven't talked too much about, which is the technology maturity uh, across the entire stack. But uh, even outside of that is we're starting to see this issue become more pressing. Yeah, actually, another another example I do remember is during the Catalonian independence referendum, the Spanish government was actually censoring, uh, b- taking down like uh, the, the, the .cat uh, TLD, they were taking down any like pro-independence websites. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's usually it's the it's actually the first uh, tool that like, you know, any uh, censoring body or authoritarian regime uses because it's so effective in Turkey, uh, Erdogan, uh, at one point, you know, blocked Twitter.com. And interestingly enough, a lot of these countries, they only block things at the DNS level because it's so effective. Once you have, uh, there's a great article uh, by Slate Star Codex, which is uh, Beware of Trivial Inconveniences, which is if you, if you make it trivially inconvenient to access the uh, website and the domain name system, what happens isn't that, you know, everyone just goes and works around it. It's just people kind of settle for that and they just now no longer access that resource. And so, uh, yeah, it, it, is, uh, it is used quite heavily around the world as a tool for a sensory. The Spanish government was only able to block the .cat uh, TLD because that's what they owned. And like we talked about, so Handshake is trying to basically only deal with it at the uh, root zone level. And you mentioned that like current DNS is already pretty decentralized at, uh, beyond the root zone. So what do you mean by that? Like, what do you mean by it's currently decentralized beyond the root zone? Mm, yeah, so what I mean by that is that each TLD is controlled or managed by a different, you know, uh, for-profit company or uh, government. And so, you know, .com is owned by VeriSign, as I mentioned, .io by Indian Ocean, uh, .cat by the, you know, Catalonian government. And that, that is what I mean by it's decentralized, is that there's already a lot of uh, stakeholders um, that at the root rely on the ICANN. Um, and and in, in that Catalonian government example, so it's actually not the case that the, uh, the government could only uh, censor .cat. They probably just did that to balk explicitly .cat. But the way that DNS works is that, and, and the way that you do DNS filtering is that you actually go to the ISPs because usually the ISPs are running your public DNS resolvers. And just to kind of make that concrete, every time you go in, uh, visit a website, so let's say you're trying to go to namebase.io, your computer is trying to find the IP address for namebase.io. And it uh, it does that by making a request to a public DNS resolver that's usually, you know, like hard-coded into your like network router. So it's usually your ISP. And it makes a request to that ISP and says, hey, uh, what is the IP address of namebase.io? And then the ISP returns it. Uh, the ISP behind the scenes is making a request to uh, the root servers. And then from there, it, there's actually a chain. It, it goes from the root servers to, oh, okay, .com is here, goes to .com. Okay, where's, or, you know, .io is here. Okay, .io, where is Namebase? Goes to that name server. Okay, na- what's Namebase.io's uh, IP address? Uh, and it follows that chain. But that is how your computer gets the IP address of a domain name. Which is why a couple of years ago in, in Turkey, you know, there were these images of like people spray painting, you know, the Google DNS or the open DNS IP addresses on, you know, like walls of the city, this sort of thing. Exactly. And that was like an easy way to get around it because the, the ISPs, okay, they, they've removed those, those domain names from, you know, their internal DNS, but they haven't actually blocked traffic to other DNS servers, which would be virtually impossible because anybody can spin up a, a DNS server and just like mirror, you know, Google's DNS or whatever. I mean, like, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and that's also why the uh, governments can actually block any domain name is because you just at the ISP level, you have them block that domain name request. And then now you've, you've blocked access to any name. On topic of censorship, I'd like to get down to the maybe like the, the market 
uh, dynamics in the system. So we, we've, we've talked about the fact that uh, ICANN is the, the governing body that essentially decides who is able to own and register a TLD. And we haven't really talked about like what's happened in the last couple of years is that ICANN has opened up TLD level applications. So that's why in the last 10 years or so, there's been like a thousand new TLDs, you know, like dot Paris or dots, whatever dot sex or dot, you know, all these TLDs that have emerged in the last, um, in the last decade are because ICANN has opened that up and there's a, there's a fee to do that. So like, if you want to own a domain, a, t- a TLD, you have to apply it costs like 200 grand, uh, yeah, $200,000. Uh, and then uh, ICANN looks at that application and they can uh, you know, accept it or deny it. And there's a whole industry around this. So there's a company called Donuts, for example, you guys can look this up. It's like, they own a lot of these new TLDs that have emerged in the last, whatever, 10 years. So Handshake, it decentralizes that governing body. But I think that in a way, it just kind of moves this monopoly problem that we have in the DNS system. It moves it up a layer to the TLD level. Now, of course, because anybody can register a TLD, it just creates an unlimited amount of TLD. Like there's a potential for an unlimited amount of TLDs. But uh, for for TL for TLDs that are shelling points, right, like words in the dictionary, for example, you know, Donuts Inc. could go up and like buy up all those TLDs, and effectively, still, we would still have a situation where we're renting domain names, and there's a monopoly at that level. So, like, I'd like to ad- for you to address that, perhaps. The other thing is that you know, if because like the domain name industry is monopolized by companies and they're capitalistic and they also exist in jurisdictions, I think that at some point they would also be subject to, we would also end up in a situation where there'd be censorship because say a a government or some jurisdiction doesn't like this website for some reason, well, they can just target, you know, the company that owns the TLD and say, okay, you need to now take down this website or implement laws that make it easier for them to do that. So maybe address the two issues. So one is the monopolistic characteristic of, of DNS just kind of rising up to the TLD level and then how we can address the censorship issue. The key here is that the monopoly issue isn't shifted. It's actually just completely blown up. And what I mean by that is because of the fact that you can register any TLD on Handshake very, very easily. So for context, when I can actually uh, opened up the TLD application program. Uh, it's called the GTLD program. They enforce a $200,000, $185,000 application fee just to apply to register a new TLD. And so you can actually apply and, and not get it and you're still you know, paying $185,000. And then on top of that, there's usually an auction so that you know the, the cost of the TLD is not just that $185,000 uh, fee is another, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars to actually go and, and win it uh, through that auction. So one is the the cost of the TLDs is uh, prohibitive, so that it's only you know very wealthy companies or you know people starting big initiatives that are able to actually go and register a TLD. So on that level, uh, on the cost level alone, it's actually uh, very not democratized, right? It's only people with a lot of capital. And then on top of that, the ICANN GTLD program is actually currently closed. Um, so it's expected that they might reopen in the next two to three years. That's what people were saying two to three years ago when we started. Uh, it probably will eventually open, but you're still going to have that same dynamic where um, you know it's going to be prohibitively expensive to actually register a new TLD, and that cost is really important because uh, you know look, if you if you look at Handshake and you say okay, what if someone like Donuts buys up a lot of TLDs, and you know I would say in that regard, uh, Handshake on its own today already has more unique owners of TLDs than exist in the ICANN system. Uh, over 460,000 TLDs have been registered uh, in, the, in the first year of Handshake. And the, uh, the key here is like, let's say, uh, but let, let's say it was a single company that registered all of them, right? So let's say it was a single company that registered all of them. And now you're like, oh man, this, the, this company can just monopolize all these TLDs. I mean, not even all of them, but let's say just like, re- they register like the top 1,000 words in the dictionary, right? Like Yeah, totally. Or whatever, like just the things that people would use. Like they're not going to use some random string of characters, but they're you know they're going to use words. Totally. So the the really important key is that you can just go and register your own TLD on Handshake. So you actually have that choice, 
And it's also not even expensive to do that. So if you're registering, uh, because it's through an auction system, if you're registering a name that's like in really high demand, so for example, like Wallet, uh, Wallet went for 350,000 HNS, which I think at the time was about $50,000. And so uh, that's a name that's very expensive. But for a name like Tiashan, right, that's like a very random name, uh, but it's my name is really important to me, I was able to register that for like a few hundred HNS, I think. So uh, the price really varies. But the, the key is that if, if uh, you know, a lot of these names were registered, like these dictionary names, that's fine because you just go and register uh, another name on Handshake that hasn't been registered. And there are, I mean, the namespace is, is really, really huge. And so, you know, you, you can still find good .coms uh, if you're creative enough that aren't registered. And so like, it's, it's possible, you just have to be creative. And we're definitely not at that point yet in Handshake today. And I would expect we're not gonna be there for another you know, five, 10 years, where it's like, oh man, all the good ones or all the ones that if I think about it for 30 minutes are gone. Uh, today, it's still very much like, okay, if I think about it for a little bit, I'm able to actually go and register uh, a very good name that hasn't been auctioned off yet. So one last question I have about like sort of the, uh, you know, this backward compatibility is, you know, like you mentioned, right now, Handshake has already set aside uh, all the current TLDs that ICANN has, like, already sold off. And so for now, it is backwards compatible. But what happens, like, two to three years from now when they do, ICANN does start to sell off some more TLDs. And now you have a fork in the ICANN versus Handshake system. And how do you have ideas for how to resolve this? Or is the hope that, you know... By that time, Handshake will become so big that ICANN will be obsoleted or like, how do you deal with this upcoming fork? That's kind of inevitable. Definitely, definitely. On, on, on the one hand, I would say, you know, in the internet today, the things that get adoption, they get adoption very, very quickly, right? As opposed to, you know, even a decade ago. And so I would actually expect by that time, uh, Handshake is, is very popular, uh, so popular and integrated that it actually just is able to supersede ICANN in that conflict. But also, if, if you look at that, the conflict itself, so ICANN uh, only does a few hundred TLDs max each year. Uh, that's all that they can kind of handle. There's, there's a huge review process. It takes, it takes years to kind of go through and get a TLD. And uh, so they can only support a few hundred uh, max. Handshake uh, has already registered in this for a CR of 460,000. So, you know, if you, if you take 500 uh, out of 460,000, uh, that's 0.1% of the names that would potentially conflict. And so the number of names that are actually conflicting is, is very, very uh, small compared to the total number of handshake TLDs out there. Uh, so to the extent that there would be conflicts, uh, it, it would be very small. And it also really the, the issue of the conflicts changes depending on how these names are being used. So that's another aspect of uh, you know, the why now question that we actually haven't touched on, which is the technological maturity of the other protocols that you compose with the decentralized naming system. So it's only in the last year that we saw decentralized storage systems like you know, IPFS and Filecoin finally launching. There's another storage system called uh, Saya's uh, Skynet that we really like. We've had them on the show. Yeah, yeah so like, you know, now, now you have these decentralized storage systems that have come out. And then also you have, you know, a cache, which is like decentralized server uh, servers. And the, the key thing to note here is that it's not that these uh, different protocols now enable us to take the existing web applications that have succeeded and, you know, make them decentralized. It, it does enable that. And that's, that's probably going to be the first thing that happens, right? And any new, you know, technology paradigm, uh, you take the existing world and you kind of, you know, shift it into the new world. Uh, that's just kind of how it, the technology usually develops. Uh, but it actually enables new types of applications. So, for example, you can actually enable uh, a decentralized Reddit built on top of Handshake and Skynet that is uh, fully decentralized, but has the same usability of reddit.com. But it's actually go, possible to then go and build a uh, decentralized Twitter or decentralized Tumblr that actually uses that decentralized Reddit data uh, in its network. And, and that's a, a whole separate discussion. But basically, the, the, the summary of that is you can actually build entirely new types of applications that's only just getting explored because the technology has only just matured. And that's a really key component because uh, if you think about a decentralized naming system, it, it always needs to be paired with something else, 
right, that you're trying to access. And so if it's just decentralized names to traditional servers, that's a that's a hard uphill battle. You know, I, I think it's still maybe possible, but that's really and, and you know, there there is a security benefit, but that's a really hard uphill battle because the benefits of that are very hard to see. Right. The, the issue of most security problems is that if a security engineer is doing a good job, you don't really hear, uh, you know, nothing notable happens. And so it's actually very hard to make that concrete to people, that benefit concrete to you know, normal people outside of a very niche security minded uh, folks. You know, the handshake vision is like, you know, getting these TLDs and building the market for that. I think that there is a non-zero probability that handshake gets adopted, but with the caveat that it will end up as a, you know, all under a single TLD. So, you know, despite me having bought, you know, dot sunny expecting it to be a TLD, I'm what what might end up happening is like I can and like all, you know, all the web infrastructure ends up adopting it. But with the caveat that really what I ended up buying was sunny.hns or something like that. Would you consider that a win in your book? Or do you think that would be like, a disappointment as a end result of all this? I was, I would consider that not a loss, but I think that uh, handshake has greater potential than that. And, and I think that, uh, yeah, the, but you're, you're totally right that there is a non-zero probability. I mean, for any of these systems, like, you know, there's a, there's a few different states that reality could go into. One is just complete failure. You know, every, everyone's just completely gone from this ecosystem uh, in five years. Another one is, you know, complete success. All right, this is, uh, the system that Google and you know all the other browsers have adopted, and 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 there's there's uh, precedent and there's there's reasons for that and why it's uh, you know economically desirable desirable for them to do that. Uh, but then there's other one which is okay, yeah, maybe it gets adoption and it's under a namespace like uh, HNS just for you know even further backwards compatibility. I could I could see that happening. How does it work for someone to actually like be able to access a domain in their browser? Do I need to like add some DNS entries to my uh, to my network settings, or is there a plugin, or like how do we access the the DNS system? There are a number of ways, and uh, basically every day they they kind of get better. So, for example, right now, uh, you know, Brennan Ike, who founded Brave, has uh, you know tweeted that they have a plan for Handshake underway, uh, and so I would say you know in a few few months, I wouldn't be surprised if it's the easiest way is just, you know, open Brave browser uh, and visit a handshake name. But outside of that today, uh, there's Puma browser, which is like a crypto focused mobile browser you can use on your phone uh, that supports handshake. You can also use HNS.to. It's a, you know, it's a gateway, like an IPFS gateway, but for handshake. And so if you go and visit nb.hns.to, that actually goes to our uh, decentralized link tree. We call it a D-link. It's a, a website, a static website hosted on Skynet and resolved through a handshake name. And you just visit that in your browser. And so you have the gateway. Uh, that's fairly easy. Uh, there's a few Chrome extensions out there. And then now, just uh, just this month, there's now a uh, public DNS resolver that supports handshake. So if you go into your computer settings and uh, you know you enter in the IP addresses, it's uh, in this case, it's 103.196.38.38. Um, if you if you change your setting to that, it takes thirty seconds. Then you can go and visit uh, handshake sites in your browser. I've already remembered the IP address. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but like, so how does it work then? So that works for the browser, of course. You know, it works for HTTP traffic. But what about if I want to set up like you know an, an email address like at you know, me at Sebastian or something? Or what if I have a website that? Um, has an API and other services need to access uh, a domain name, they would also need to be aware of the resolver, would they not? Yeah. And uh, so, for example, email, the way email works is that uh, you you would need the email server that's sending you an email to uh, be able to resolve the handshake names. And that's that's actually fairly easy to do. You just need to kind of update the settings, but it would, it would require adoption on uh, on that front, right? So you, you want to go and have, you know, different email providers support it. And similarly for for APIs, right? Yeah, and similarly for APIs. Although it's, you know, it's basically you just you change the, uh, you change the DNS resolver or you, or you use a, uh, you know, a JavaScript plugin and you just point the DNS resolver to uh, a handshake DNS resolver and uh, you're good to go there. But there is this, there is this uh, friction involved that, also is why I believe that the, the main source of the adoption is not from 
getting existing services onto Handshake because that's just such a uphill battle. I think it's really uh, enabling new use cases that were not possible before. And if, and if you look at like Bitcoin, for example, usually for these technologies, it's a, it goes through a similar path, which is, you know, Bitcoin's initial uh, main value prop, right, is, is hedge against uh, inflation. It was explicitly called out, uh, you know, at launch of the, of the money printing happening with fiat currencies. Uh, but the thing is, if you think, look at Bitcoin's adoption, it's only 10 years in that we're starting, starting to see people uh, look at Bitcoin because of that inflation, right? This year, you know, like 20% of the money supply or something like that was printed. And now you have, you know, big public companies being like, oh, wow, you know, what? I actually kind of need to hold some Bitcoin as a hedge. But it's only 10 years in that we're getting that uh, feedback loop uh, of that, that value. But the thing that Bitcoin was first useful for was, you know, buying drugs on the, on the internet. That was something that was not served at all by existing fiat systems. And so it got adoption there. And then after, uh, you know, buying drugs, it was, uh, you know, basically financial speculation, gambling. Uh, that was the thing that really put Bitcoin off the map, just like the crazy, you know, price swings. And then, you know, that, that carried it through the next, uh, you know, the three to six years. Uh, and then now we're starting to see the true value prop being recognized by people. And I think it's a similar thing for any decentralized system, which is, you know, you really only need decentralized systems when they're targeting uh, fringe users initially, right? So for Handshake, it's, it's going to go through a similar adoption. I, I think the, the real, uh, the true value props will be seen, you know, five, 10 years from now, but initially it's going to be coming from uh, these new types of applications that weren't possible before. Yeah, that makes sense. If you wanted to, to have adoption of like the native Handshake system, you know, s servers, all of the server infrastructure, right? Like the AWSs and everything like in their build packages for like the individual VMs that people are launching, they would need to have also the software to interact with that with that blockchain. I wonder if there's any value in you guys trying to address this at the standards level. So perhaps through the W3C or trying to create standards around uh, decentralized domain names there. Is that something that you think makes sense or that you've approached? I really believe that for this type of technology to succeed, it needs to start with bottoms up adoption. You know, for any type, right, right, like looking at Bitcoin as an example, it was something that was, uh, you know, mocked by, you know, serious investors, mocked by banks, right, written off. And it was really only individuals and the people that started using it that eventually was able to put it on the map. You know, Ethereum also was largely driven uh, as a community effort. You know, with Handshake, it's a similar thing where it's like, yeah, like I, I think trying to go from the top down I think it's worth putting energy into that, but I think that in order for it to, any decentralized system to succeed, it needs to have bottoms up adoption. And so that's, that's the primary thing that we're focused on, which is, okay, how can we enable new use cases and applications, decentralized applications that are not possible today? Uh, and they're, they're literally just now possible in the last six months. And of course, usually it's not just a matter of it being possible, but also it being accessible and easy for developers to understand what's possible and build. And, and so that doesn't even exist right now. Like right now we're working on uh, improving the developer documentation for Handshake and creating, you know, example uh, applications that show what types of new applications are possible. But I think it's really a matter of bottoms up adoption. That's, that's the key. And if Handshake doesn't have that, then it's never going to break out. So let's talk a little bit about like the, some of the technical details of uh, handshake. So, you know, one of the interesting things is it is built on sort of its own blockchain. And what are some of the like reasons that it was done like this, like as opposed to perhaps using something like Ethereum, or even if it's going to be its own blockchain, you know, somehow integrating more closely with like Bitcoin, you know, Namecoin, for example, was merge mined with Bitcoin, but also, especially when it comes to like the token itself, like, do you think that the requirement to use HNS to buy and sell domains is going to be a hurdle as a, like, you know, there were ways that you could have designed it such that Bitcoin could have been used for the uh, purchasing of domain names. So what were some of the reasons around these decisions? Yeah, so... The reason why Handshake is on its own chain, uh, one, one is uh, there, there are technical reasons and also uh, some path dependency. But at, at the technical level, uh, you really want to have a naming system be on its own chain uh, because you 
otherwise will have an issue of uh, congestion. So for example, if Handshake was on Ethereum, you know, right now you can go and, and submit a bid for a uh, Handshake name and it costs less than a cent to go and do. But to go and do uh, that on Ethereum, that's going to cost, you know, t- tens of dollars because it's, it's not just a bid, but there's, you know, there's multiple transactions, you know, like five, five six transactions that you need to submit across the course of an, of an auction. And so to do that on another chain like Ethereum uh, that has congestion from other transactions, right? So for, you know, like now Ethereum is really popping off, but let's say, you know, a lot of times the main sources of network traffic on Ethereum were these like, you know, Ponzi coins and stuff like that. And so now you have this system where it's uh, the cost of it is now uh, completely linked to random other systems that are completely separate and don't benefit at at all. So at, at the congestion level, that's one reason why you want it. And then also in terms of the technology itself. So there was a certain type of proof that uh, needed to be written in order for uh, a light client to exist for Handshake. So you basically need a proof that a name like hasn't been registered or uh, basically like a negative proof without getting too technical. And that just wasn't really possible on Ethereum. And you know, the people behind Handshake initially, right, Joseph Poon, super big Ethereum guy, he's, he's super into it. Uh, and, and he was you know, well aware of the benefits of building something on Ethereum. But the issue is just at a technical level, uh, this, like, there's a certain type of proof that's just not really possible, uh, but it is possible on Handshake and it's used uh, in HNSC, which is a light client uh, for resolving the names. Yeah, like hyper-efficient light clients are important. But, but so I guess my, the other part was about, you know, why not closer integration with Bitcoin? So, you know, you could have had Handshake be on its own chain, but you could have maybe had it like have a built-in light client for Bitcoin. So that way that allows me to pay for things in Bitcoin and that triggers events on Handshake. So uh, we, for context, uh, we just recorded a episode with uh, Blockstack uh, last week. And so this is kind of how their stacks system works, where it uh, has a built-in SBV into Bitcoin. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, you know, I'm not familiar enough with Blockstack's technology to be able to say whether, you know, it was possible or not, or maybe it was possible, maybe, you know, I think it took Blockstack a few years to get to where they are now. So maybe it would have, you know, just been launching now. One is at the technology at the time, I think that that wasn't really available. And then also, I'm not so sure, even if it's, you know, you just flip the switch and make that happen, that's desirable or necessary. And that's actually why we built Namebase, which is, you know, we came on, uh, learned about Handshake, and we got super excited about it. But we realized that in order for people to actually go and adopt it, uh, you would need some sort of on-ramp to make it really easy to use. And so that's why, it, because you know, for developers, right, they're, developers are fairly lazy. They don't want to go and have to go through you know, 20 steps just to go and get a name to play with an experimental system that hasn't proven its value yet. And so what we did is we built an on-ramp so that anyone, anyone can go and buy a Handshake name. They can actually buy it with Bitcoin today and uh, buy HNS, go and bid on a name. Uh, you don't actually even need to verify your account if you're just trying to get a name. And so we built that on-ramp and we actually have a fiat on-ramp for US customers as well. Uh, we're also launching a fiat on-ramp for international customers very soon. And basically that, that was what we decided needed to exist in order to enable uh, mass adoption for Handshake. So I think you know, m- maybe it could have benefited if it supported that uh, directly on chain at launch, but you know, just in terms of how things played out, it, it you know, it uses its own HNS coin. Uh, and that's actually uh, perfectly fine, because there are these on ramps like Namebase that exist that make it really accessible and easy to use. So let's talk a little bit about this, like auction mechanisms and stuff. So one of the things that comes from like, you not having, you know, some sort of smart contracting on the handshake chain natively, like you basically are kind of lock into using this like one auction design that's like built into the uh into the chain is there a way for me to like let's say i bought a a tld is is there a way for me to use the handshake chain to like auction off my like second level domains and stuff yeah yeah so there isn't a way to do that for second level domains and and the key thing to note here is that Handshake is very, very focused on the TLD issue, right? So it's, it's only, the names are only for the top level domains. Uh, SLDs are managed, uh, one is you can manage it the traditional way, which is you, you have your uh, TLD pointing to a name server, and then you can issue SLDs from the name server. And we actually have a service that lets people create their own registry and start selling the SLDs 
from that registry. Uh, and then there are also efforts to bridge uh, Handshake onto Ethereum, and then now you can have uh, SLDs on Ethereum. And there are certain uh, interesting aspects of that. So the SLDs are all managed off-chain. Uh, but in terms of, you know, let's say you, you own a name and you want to, you know, like re-auction it or sell it, uh, we actually have uh, created a marketplace for that. And it's really nice because not only can you go and, and, and resell your name, but also as a, as a buyer, a lot of times you might be looking for your name and you might find, oh, someone else registered it, but you can actually go and make an offer uh, or they might have listed it for a buy now price and you can go in and, and sell that. Uh, and that, that secondary market activity has actually been growing uh, exponentially. So the, for the past six months, it's been growing at 70% month over month. A lot of, there are even people now, you know, existing domainers, they're kind of like full-time uh, getting handshake names and, and selling them now, they're making like a few thousand dollars a month. So that ecosystem is actually really growing on uh, the marketplace. You know, I think it's kind of driven by this like NFT trend as well. Uh, and if you go to namebase.io, you can see all of them uh, listed for a sale. So that's, that's one way that you can do it. You can solve it with applications on top of handshake. Are there other companies or, or projects that are building also on top of handshake and providing similar services to namebase? Or do you guys have some sort of monopoly there like either implied or, or not yeah totally so we definitely don't have uh, a monopoly anyone can go and come uh compete with us you know and, and that's that's very welcome there are other companies this company impervious which was just started which is uh really focused on core you know handshake development you know that was created just to bring a, a full-time dev uh, matt zipkin to go and work on handshake uh at the blockchain level full-time and then there are also now uh, individual domain holders. So, for example, Jihan Chu, he just bought .nft uh, on on uh, through the namebase marketplace. Actually, we helped broker that, but he bought that for eighty four thousand um, dollars, and it was actually a really nice return for the initial purchaser. It was, it was bought for five hundred dollars from the initial purchaser, uh, and then sold for eighty four thousand dollars after uh, four or five months. Um, so that was great. But Jihan Chu is now trying to start. Uh, you know, a registry business, a business on top of .nft. So you kind of have, uh, you know, businesses at different layers. You can have it at over an, an individual TLD and then also, uh, you know, serving the ecosystem as a whole. Um, but I would say it's also, you know, Handshake is still very small. The community, uh, it's been growing, which has been awesome to see, but it's still, you know, even within crypto, I think it's, it's, it's fairly niche and not a lot of people have heard of it. Uh, that's partly because the, you know, there's no centralized foundation, you know, doing a lot of marketing for Handshake. You know, in retrospect, maybe some of that $10 million should have been spent, you know, just promoting Handshake. But I think this uh, organic grassroots adoption is also uh, nice in its own way. But it's, it's more so due to that than, uh, you know, there's, there's no sort of monopoly or anything. The use case you mentioned before about like the, the contacting existing owners is actually, I think, a really, you know, something I didn't realize. But like, I, so I actually did this process last night where uh, I went and like contacted someone. To, and bought their domain name and it was I, there's this big problem with like existing like thing where like existing domain names where you know sometimes i want to buy a domain name and i look at it and it was like registered back in like 2002 or something never been touched but they have like auto renew set up already and they have a, and nowadays everyone uses like dns privacy stuff and so it's really hard to see like there's no way for me to contact this person and like uh actually like even like make them an offer. But with on Handshake, on Namebase at least, it was very easy for me to like contact them. I made an offer, then they made a counter offer, and then I made a counter offer, and then they hit accept. And it was like, wow, that process took like an hour and I was able to do that. That was I think I think that was a really cool. Oh, that's great. One of the things I had questions I had about the auction though while I was going through the process was there's like this distinction between a like the open part of a bid and a sealed part of the bid. What is the purpose of this? Like, why wouldn't I want to just put my entire amount in the sealed portion? Yeah, totally. So um, the reason why is because uh, the, the Vickery auction, the way that you uh, construct a Vickery auction typically is that, you know, people submit their blind bids, right? I, I bid something, you bid something. And then at the end of the auction, it's revealed, oh, I actually bid 1,000 and you bid a 500. And so I win and I pay 500. And that's, uh, you need that blind factor for the Vickery auction to work. The, the challenge is on chain, it's, uh, you know, how do you create a blind auction? Um, you know, it's, it's fairly uh, tricky to do there. One way that you can create a blind auction is by having a bid portion and a blind portion. Um, and that's what was done 
uh, with Handshake. Uh, basically, it was it was created in order to obscure the true value of the bids uh, because every bid on chain, you know, it's not you don't have a case where all the uh, bidders are submitting their bids at the same time and that data is public. And so you need some way of obscuring uh, your bid uh, in order for the victory auction to work. And so that's why there is a blind portion so that I can, for example, submit a 500 HNS bid and a 500 HNS blind on chain, you'll only see a thousand HNS uh, as a total lockup, and you don't know what the actual bid amount is. Uh, you know, it could be anywhere from zero to a thousand HNS ah. uh, until it's all revealed. But you, you, you need that uh, just because of everything's on chain. I see. So the blind isn't the portion that's being bid. That's just like the okay. I get it now. That makes sense. Yeah, is that obscuring them? Yeah. If if you could force everyone to submit their bids at the same time, you wouldn't need this. But you know, because you you don't. Um, that's that's why you need it. What is sort of like the role of Namebase in all of this? And like, what is your guys' business model when it comes to, you know, being this, you know, you guys seem to be this very important linchpin in the entire Handshake ecosystem. What do you guys get out of it? Yeah, totally. So I would, uh, one is, I would say in terms of Namebase's role, uh, it's just like everyone else in the community, which is we're all directors of Handshake. Uh, you know, I might have mentioned that before, but Handshake is a very community run Project. So there's no centralized foundation. Uh, there's no you know, person that's like the CEO of Handshake. And if you go onto the website, you'll see it. It basically says, oh, if you're part of the Handshake community or if you want to help it, you uh, you too can call yourself a director of Handshake. So, you know, ultimately we are just directors of Handshake like everyone else. But I, I see our role as really just we're trying to do uh, whatever we can to further adoption. And so, you know, when we first discovered Handshake, we saw the potential, but we also, you know, th there are huge barriers to adoption, right? There's so much friction and you guys point out a lot of really great points, which is that it's, it's, it's really, you need a huge amount of motivation to adopt it, which is why I also think that um, it's only now that there is this, you know, Web3 movement that's so strong. And now you have these Web3 protocols and uh, new Web3 applications that open up once you actually have, uh, you know, decentralized naming and decentralized storage and decentralized compute. And it's only now that I think that this thing actually has a chance I've even taken off. Uh, but ultimately, you still need really easy onboarding, uh, similar to how you know Bitcoin really started to break out once Coinbase made Bitcoin accessible to the common person. You know, for, for us at Namebase, we're trying to do the same thing. We're trying to re reduce as much friction as possible to onboard people. That's why we created an on-ramp. You know, that's why we created the bidding system. That's why we created uh, the marketplace so that you know you coming on would be able to get your name if, even after someone else registered it. So that's really what we uh, see as our role is trying to reduce the friction uh, and also just kind of showing you know people what's possible on Handshake because you know we, we didn't get too into the specifics on the types of applications that are possible, but uh, it's 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 actually really really cool and, and that's that's a good discussion for a separate time maybe. Or we can just show you because we're releasing a few things uh, in the next month. But basically, it's just to support the ecosystem. And then in terms of monetization, so we're not primarily focused on monetization at the moment. It's really just on uh, helping to grow the ecosystem. Uh, but on the on ramp, that makes money as a you know traditional on ramp, similar to Coinbase. So it's just uh, you know selling and buying the coin uh, with a uh, spread, uh, and typically we try to target around one to three percent, and so that that brings in a little bit of revenue. It's it's basically uh, you know it's, it's very very small at this point, right? Just because the ecosystem is so small, um, and then on, on the marketplace, there's also a three percent transaction fee on the marketplace, which you know again is uh, is quite small. So what what we're looking to do, although I I will say that we um, in terms of the transaction volume, we help to process. Uh, you know, since, since launch, we've had to process, you know, tens of millions of dollars, uh, or I think, mil yeah, over, over $10 million in, uh, you know, bidding volume, right? So we help people actually place a lot of bids on Handshake, but effectively that those are our current revenue streams, uh, but we're primarily focused on, uh, growing the ecosystem. So tell us, uh, where, what's coming up in your roadmap and, uh, what's the future uh, for name base? Like, where do you see yourself in the next 10 years? Yeah, so right now we're uh, really focused on uh, improving the utility of handshake names. So the interesting, one of the interesting applications that you can actually use with your handshake name is, yeah, you can use it as a, uh, a decentralized website, right? So I shared nb.hns.to. It's a you know, fully decentralized website using Skynet uh, for the storage. And um, you can actually 
also use your handshake name for decentralized login. And so we actually just designed a protocol uh, so that you can actually go and authenticate to a website using your handshake name. Uh, no passwords are transmitted. You're, you control your name and you're just able to authenticate and prove that you own the name. And so we just are uh, releasing a forum, uh, Namer News. If you go to news.namebase.io, it should actually be up there already. But the cool thing about the forum is you're able to use your handshake name to authenticate. And the really neat thing is we also, and you're using your handshake name as your username, we also detect when that handshake name resolves to a website. So for example, if, if I make a post, you'll see my name highlighted, which indicates it's, it's also a website. And you can go and click on my name and you're actually brought to uh, my, my decentralized uh, Linktree page. Uh, and so the really cool thing about that, and then also if you go on Twitter, you'll see my name is Tishan Slash, and you'll see all the people in the Handshake community, they change their names to their name Slash, and that just indicates that they have that name, they have a website at that name. And you can kind of think of it as this, uh, you know, insurance for my digital identity. Uh, basically what that's saying is, you know, if, if anything happens to my Twitter account, if I move or if it gets taken down, you can always go to Tishan on Handshake, right? Or even if you're not using a resolver, you go to tishan.hns.to, and you can see my list of links and only I have the ability to you know update those links right only I have the ability to update my name and so you always be able to find me online um, and that 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 application of the login that's the next thing that we're releasing which just kind of shows uh, some of the different applications they can use uh, for your handshake name I don't know if you guys have thought of doing this or if this exists but it would be really cool uh, if there was this kind of scaffold sort of re repo that would allow anyone to just like deploy a, their website to some decentralized service like SIA or, or, or IPFS, have that website be behind a, a name-based domain. And it's just like, this is your, your decentralized web stack, you know, uh, sort of repo or like a package. And it allows you to, you know, create your, like your, your own personal homepage uh, that points to all the different places where you are. Like, that, I don't know, does, that, does that exist? Because I would love to like, do something like that. Totally, yeah. So that's, that, that's why we created this product called D-Links, which basically lets you do uh, that for a, uh, you know, a list of links that you want to point to. It's basically like Linktree, except it's using you know, handshake names and uh, Skynet uh, for storage. And uh, that actually has gotten some really cool adoption. Uh, this guy, Lange Fran, uh, he's like one of the top rappers in the Netherlands and uh, actually one of the community members gifted him his name and now he has a D-Link page uh, set up. And so that's one of the really cool things about the community is a lot of the community members, they are also trying to you know, further adoption of the protocol and they'll go out and, and gift names to people that they think are uh, relevant. And then on top of that for general websites, actually this company called Fleek, which is built on top of uh, IPFS, they're supporting handshake names too now. And so uh, that's another company in the ecosystem uh, and soon you'll be able to deploy, uh, you know, any type of website using Fleek to your handshake name. Um, and so you're, you're starting to see kind of some of the building blocks coming out really before, you know, and we only released D-Links in the last like month or two. And so really before um, the last, you know, two months, all of the benefits and all of the, you know, interesting things about handshake that you could do were very theoretical. Uh, a lot of the community members were playing and experimenting, but it was really, really hard to explain handshake and kind of show the utility uh, because these applications, just the infrastructure was being built out. Now we're seeing to, you know, starting to see uh, some of it come uh, into existence, which is really exciting because people are actually uh, using it. You know, over 400 people have created D-Links now already, which is pretty big if you think about, you know, like decentralized applications, right? Most of them only have like a thousand users max. Um, and so a lot of people have actually started creating these decentralized websites. And, you know, as Fleet comes on board, as this Handshake login comes out, um, and there's a few other things in the pipeline too. Um, I think we're going to see more and more uh, usage and adoption. Cool. Well, it's uh, it's a really interesting project, and uh, I hope you all the success. Uh, because yeah, as we've uh, talked about today, this is a a huge problem to tackle, and uh, it's very much needed. I think. Thanks. Thanks again for coming on. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much. 
and we look forward to being back next week.